Hello again, folks. K.R. King with a special outdoor edition of my channel. As I mentioned previously, I'm in the middle of a move. I don't have my lighting set up. Uh, things are all this and that. So I'm doing this out on my back patio with the sound of uh, air conditioners everywhere here in Southern California and power tools I noticed went off conveniently. So hopefully the sound won't be too bad. The reason I'm doing this is I am doing a series, as I mentioned, on map making, a dungeon draft, wonder draft, and in the process of, I, I did some intros and outros before the, the lighting setup was gone, but I realized that I also want to talk about sort of the philosophy of why instead of just how in terms of making maps. Because the thing about why is you've got to think about, you know, how do the players encounter the maps in your world? How do they use them? How do you as a GM present those maps? What do you expect the players to do uh, when they get a map or when they're creating a map? You know, and it can make a difference in terms of a tabletop game, you know, traditionally, which are hopefully now coming back, but also in terms of running a virtual tabletop. Because understanding the, you know, how players are going to use it, how you're going to do it, makes a difference in terms of how you draw maps. In other words, before you learn how to make a map, you need to understand why you're making that map. You know, when you're creating a truly homebrewed world, that means you're creating that world, right? The, the globe that orbits around some sun, the continents on that, uh, all the way down to the, you know, rivers and mountain ranges, deserts, the cities and towns, you know, all the way to the lairs and temples and whatnot. And how as a GM you orient the players to that world is through maps of some kind. And again, in a pre-made adventure or whatever, you have maps that tell the players what things look like and in a homebrewed world. You know, and there's an interplay in terms of game mechanics, uh, how the players and the GM interact via these maps. Does the GM just hand out maps for everything, the continent, the cities, uh, you know, perhaps even the dungeons, whatever, or do they give the players nothing? The players literally have to map everything out themselves, or is it somewhere in between? But you know, the thing is, the degree to which the GM, you know, gives the players information in the maps, and the degree to which the players are going to have to come up with this themselves, makes a big difference in the gameplay. Because the thing is, if you have access to very detailed maps, let's say the geography of the, an area between two cities or whatever, it's going to make traveling between those cities very easy. They're going to know the shortest way to get there. They're going to know potential areas where you could get in trouble. And most importantly, they're not going to get lost. And of course, it's the opposite if they have to map all the way from a blank slate. You know, they may just know it's over in that direction, but what's the quickest way to get there? Uh, what happens if they get blocked and they have to turn around or they get trapped or they get lost? So we know it makes a big difference mechanically. And the thing is to think about are two aspects of how much you want to provide the players with maps or have them map on their own. One is the metagame aspect of how mechanically you want the process of playing the game to unfold. And then when you get into the game, you know, a lot of the map information is going to be based on the level of civilization of your world. The thing is, for me, the, the metagame aspect is heavily influenced by my experience playing D&D from the original days, when basically we, you know, started with, you know, one hex in the city we were in. Uh, maybe there was a road, we had some information about roads going to other cities, but that was pretty much it. And in terms of the starting city, we had some major, you know, uh, the main keep, uh, armory, tavern, this sort of thing, the guilds and whatnot. Uh, but the details were not as just, just shown to us on a map. So if you went out into the wilderness and you went off the main road just to, to find out what was there, you had to map this out. You had a player in the group who mapped on a you know paper and pencil. Same thing if you wanted to go to more obscure areas of the town that you started in. So the thing is, as a group progressed, they began to get a very extensive map of the general continent and world and also detailed maps of various dungeons and temples and lairs and whatnot. And the thing is, these maps, some of the information was known only to the players, they became very valuable. You know, and I think we did this out of a sense of realism in terms of our real life experiences and also the sense of, you know, what it was like to live in a medieval world, which for the most part is the world that D&D is based in. So if you think of the real world, think about, you know, the town that you live in. Generally speaking, when you're going around, you know where the major roads are, you know, kind of where they intersect, what leads where. You know the places, you know, stores or restaurants or whatnot that you frequent. 
But if you go to any kind of obscure area within your town, some place you've never been before, you may have a general sense of where it is, but if you really want to find out, you have to look at a map. Today, we look at our phones. Uh, in the old days, we had to use a physical map. You know, and sometimes when you're driving, even in a familiar area, and suddenly you're like, wait a minute, where, where is that road again? And you check the map on your phone and you go, oh, that's where it is, of course. But the thing is, you don't just have that in your head such that you can always just instantly find your way. The other thing is there are obscure places where that aren't necessarily on a map. You have to discover them and then you can orient it to a map. Suppose on a river there's some really good fishing hole or swimming hole and it's not on any map. You find it, okay, now I know where it is and now I can look on the map and that's where it is. I've been there. And of course, that could be the kind of information that you hang on to very tightly. You know, uh, you don't want to go to the swimming hole and suddenly it's crowded with tons of people. You want to keep that to yourself. So we brought the same kind of sensibility to our, you know, of the real world to our game in D&D, assuming that as you move through the world, the greater world or a dungeon or whatever, you know, you needed to map things out so that you could find your way back or get back there or whatever. Now, having said that, even in those days, I did play in campaigns where the GM just didn't even hardly use maps or just told you where it was all theater of the mind. It wasn't my style, it wasn't necessarily terrible, uh, especially if you've got a good GM, good players, you know, a good story and that sort of thing. But, you know, again, I always felt like there was that unrealism of just generally being able to just find your way all the time. So the other reason that we kind of made it a little bit restrictive in terms of the availability of maps in playing D&D was our sense of the medieval world. Educated people had access to maps, and these might be uh, scholars, you know, nobles or merchants. Uh, but again, as I mentioned, uh, you know, in terms of the fishing hole example, if someone had access, you know, a route to an area of rare spices or minerals, or they knew a route through some shoals, you know, in terms of shipping, uh, or perhaps they knew a shortcut over, you know, mountains or something, they would tend to keep that closely held. So you didn't just hand out maps, you know, in terms of the valuable information, and also, you know, cartographers were rare. And uneducated people generally only had a knowledge of uh, the area that they walked around on foot, which was, you know, only, you know, four or five miles from their village. And the thing is, the scale of the maps we used in terms of the hex structure were five or six miles, so when you had peasants and things, they basically did know one hex of the map. But we assumed that the player characters, as we used to call them then, super normals, you know, were more educated, they had more experience. That's why typically when you started off, you did have a map of, you knew where the various cities were and connected by roads. And then sometimes people had a background where they knew about some specific uh, area that was, you know, a little more hidden or whatever, and they had a map to that. So when you're creating maps, uh, either you know, by hand or with a virtual tabletop, you can recreate this old time system uh, by putting a grid over it and then giving the players at a, at a tabletop uh, a blank uh, grid map. I would recommend for outdoors using a hexagonal map because it gives you movement in six directions, kind of the directions of a compass. Then if you're doing a dungeon, yes, you use uh, the square grids. And again, for dungeons, if the players are mapping by hand, uh, you may, if you have some really elaborate room that you've drawn out, I used to just take the map, quickly draw that in and give it back, because if the map gets screwed up when the players are drawing it, and it's partly because you've made some tricky shaped room or something, you know, it's a drag. Now, another thing is when we drew those maps up, uh, the players would draw them up, when we got into a battle situation, we would usually shift over to an erasable a battle map, draw those quickly up with markers because then the square sizes was larger in terms of putting figures on and whatnot. Now running online presents some challenges in terms of the, you know, encounter maps or tactical maps, it's pretty good because, you know, something like Fantasy Grounds or Roll20, you can import a JPEG uh, and create a line of sights where the players, as they move through, see what they can see. Uh, as they've gone by an area, they can still see it. It's usually shaded or whatever. So basically, they do create the map as they move. It's a little trickier when you have a strategic sort of wilderness map. I have run before where uh, you run on kind of a blank hexagonal map as we would go to each hex. Uh, the GM would tell us the terrain, and we'd have an alphanumeric, you know, P for plains, M for mountains, something like that. I found this not to be as satisfying. It doesn't work as well, I feel like, as in terms of the tactical maps. If you out there, any of my viewers or anybody, have run a virtual campaign where you've used more of a strategic continent map that I'm talking about where you're going hex by hex outside and you figured out a way to run that, please let me know. I'd love to find out.
So those are kind of the metagame considerations for when you're creating maps, what you're thinking about in terms of that interaction, how much information do you give the players. Then you have the in-game uh, information, which is the level of civilization. And what you find here uh, in the real world and in D&D is, you know, this, these levels of civilization are usually geographical, right? Some areas are highly developed. They have cities and towns, they have areas of agriculture, they have road networks connecting them, they have people moving back and forth, so that knowledge of the terrain and the maps would be fairly common. But then you have undeveloped areas. Not a lot of people live there. There aren't roads and whatnot. There the maps are going to be sketchy, if at all. And of course, it's the same thing in the real world. If you go to you know, the Amazon or Siberia or something, you know, you're not going to have really detailed maps. Even though we have satellite technology, think of some place like Canada, and the Yukon, right? Where we, you know, it's a highly developed country, but that area is very unpopulated. There aren't roads and things through there. If you're on the ground, even though you could be looking above from satellite, even if you have phone service or whatever, you're going to have a hard time walking along on the ground knowing where you are. So if that's the way it is in the real world, think about how it would be in D&D. You're going on foot in a totally wild, undeveloped area, you know, overgrown, none of the markers that we use to you know, orient ourselves. All right, so the last thing that I'm going to talk about is going to relate to my next video in which I'm going to be using the Wonder Draft uh, mapping software, is thinking about the scale of your map. And the thing that I found is it's super fun when you get mapping software to start drawing continents, you know, and incredible inlets and mountain ranges and rivers and deserts and this kind of thing. And you just kind of draw it on whatever, you know, the default setting is or whatever, and you're not really thinking about, well, how big is this place or whatever. And then when you get into translating it into game terms, you start to go, well, wait a minute, if I put a hex structure on this, you know, how big can I make the hexes? What does this represent? Is it realistic in terms of where cities are and whatnot? Because the thing is, whether you're just drawing this freehand on a piece of paper or even hex paper, or whether you're using, you know, a 1920 by 1080 pixel, you know, virtual map on mapping software, you do want to think about whether the map you're making is of, of an area of, say, Europe or England. Because both can be depicted on the same size, either piece of paper or virtual pixel map. What is going to change is the scale of that map relative to the size of the map itself. And how this becomes really important in terms of gameplay is movement. Because a map of Europe on a, you know, 1920 by 1080 pixel map is going to take much longer to travel across on foot than a map of England on that same size paper or you know virtual map. And you're going to want to track that movement in time as a GM, as I pointed out in an earlier video. So if you are doing that, you need some method of marking that progress on a map. And the thing is, if you have a very large scale map in which one you know, hex on this map is a vast area, that can be a little tricky. So you want to have a scale on your map that's workable in terms of some kind of hex structure. Even if the players, if they're drawing it themselves, they're just moving along, you're telling them what the terrain is, and you're keeping track of things like supplies or weather or, or time going on, you know, outside the players in the world. And the thing about this is, even if you're doing a theater of the mind and you're tracking everything and just telling the players, you need to know how long it's taking and where they are on your map, even if you're not giving them that information. So what I'm going to do in the next video, I'm going to go over Wonder Draft, some basic stuff, just introducing the software, but then I'm going to use an existing map. I'm going to use England as a map to show you how you can think about scale, how you can think about the hex structure that you're going to have, and how that translates in terms of making that to the size so that then you can translate it to your own world. So until next time, if you like my channel, please subscribe. I'm always looking for more. Uh, if you have any comments, please leave them. I love to hear them. Tell me how you're running maps in your uh, online campaigns. But most importantly, my friends, keep playing D&D and tell somebody else about it.